Thank you, everyone, for joining me today. To, on today's show, we have the Honorable Congressman G.K. Butterfield. Thank you for joining us, Congressman. How are you doing today? Thank you. I'm doing well. Thank you for having me on your program. Yes, yes. Tell our viewers, for those of, you, of them who may not be that familiar with you, uh, who you are, a little bit of your background and where you're from. Well, I serve in the United States House of Representatives. I've been a congressman now for about seven and a half years. I represent the 1st Congressional District of North Carolina, which uh, would be essentially the northeastern part of North Carolina. My district starts in Elizabeth City and comes along the Virginia border down to Henderson and Oxford, uh, back over to Rocky Mount, Goldsboro, Kinston, Newburn, back up to Elizabeth City. It's a very large area, 23 counties, uh, 88 cities and towns. Uh, the district uh, consists of about 600,000 people. Uh, half of those are African American and half of those are, are not African American. And so it's a very diverse district. It's a low income, low wealth district. And so we have a lot of challenges, but I am the, the representative for this district. I was elected in 2004 and go to Washington, D.C. each week and, and represent the good people of the first district and come back on the weekend and prepare for the next week. Okay, very good, very good. So, um, Frost, I know you grew up in Wilson. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing in Wilson, North Carolina. Sure. Wilson is, is my hometown. I, I went to, I was born there and went to, to school, public schools in Wilson many years ago. Uh, we had segregated schools back during those days. And, and so uh, from grades one through 12, I went to an all black school uh, because that was the, uh, that was the, the order in, in the 60s and, and before. Uh, integration did not come along until after I finished high school. Uh, when I finished high school, I uh, came up to North Carolina College at Durham. Uh, that was the name of uh -huh. NC Central at the time. Yeah. In fact, the name actually changed while I was a student at, at North Carolina Central. Uh, I had two uh, wonderful parents. They are both deceased now. Uh, I was an only child. My dad was a dentist in my home community, and my mother was a classroom teacher. Okay. And I love to tell people that my dad practiced dentistry for 50 long years and walked out on the, on the 50th anniversary of, uh, of his <laughs> career. And my mother, uh, surprisingly, taught school for 48 years. Uh, they, were, they were very well-respected people in the community, and I, I miss them so very much, but they, they, were, they were leaders in, in the community and, and really made a difference. Uh, my mother was a native of Wilson. Uh, she uh, grew up in that community uh, uh, way back in, at the beginning of the uh, 20th century. Uh, she was born, I, was, I came along late in life, and she was actually born in 1901. My dad was born in 1900. Uh, my dad was not a, 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 a resident of North Carolina as a child. He lived on the island of Bermuda, mm -hmm. and he immigrated to the U.S. And uh, as, a, as a black man, he could not find a job in, in this country to, to suit his needs, and so he volunteered for the war. And after getting out of World War I, he uh, went to uh, Shore University in Raleigh, and that's where he met my mom, who was um, actually in high school at Shaw University. It's a long story, and I don't have time to, to give you the detail, except to say that uh, African Americans did not have high schools uh, during those days, for the most part. When you got to the sixth grade, you came out of elementary school, and, and you went to work, Yeah, um, usually, usually on a farm or in someone's kitchen. Uh, but if your parents had some... Uh, some connections. You you went off to what was called boarding school, and mm -hmm. Shaw University had a boarding school. And my mother uh, went to Shaw for high school. And while there, my dad was a freshman in college, and the two of them met and um, spent the rest of their life together. Yeah, similar story with my grandmother. She told me about that up to the sixth grade and where her education was when she was coming up in North Carolina. Um, being that you come from such a rich background, both of your parents and when you graduated high school, I'm pretty sure uh, you could have went anywhere in this country to attend a higher education or uh, institution of higher learning, but you chose North Carolina um, College at Durham, which is now NCCU. Uh, what is it about the, the city of Durham or NCCU that made you say when you was maybe a young man, 17, 18 years old, is that this is where I want to go and this is where I want to further myself and better myself? Well, there weren't a lot of opportunities. Uh, the HBCUs were, were the preferred schools for most, most kids coming along during my generation. Mm -hmm. If you were exceptionally smart or exceptionally talented, and I was not in the, that league, I, okay. I was above average, but I was not, uh, you know, I was not a 1250 or 1300 on the, on the set, uh, like some of my friends. But if you had 
um, you know, great ambitions, you, you could get out of North Carolina and go to some of the other schools. But most of us, 98% uh, of us, wanted to go to, to HBCUs. Mm -hmm. So my classmates uh, went to um, Hampton or, or Shaw, uh, Elizabeth City, A&T. A&T was a, was a big draw for, for, for many reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, but I had a desire to come to North Carolina Central. Many of my high school teachers and elementary teachers were graduates of Central. And I just had this desire to go to a liberal arts school and to eventually go to law school. And, and, and we have a law school in North Carolina Central, which is second to none in this country. And uh, so I went to both undergraduate school and law school at North Carolina Central. Glad that I did. Uh, I came to Durham, you know, as an Eastern North Carolina country boy mm -hmm. uh, who had not been exposed to, to a whole lot. And Central just opened my world, you know, the relationships that I built on the campus and the education that I got from black educators who, who uh, most of them are deceased now. Uh, uh, the Dr. Colbert Jones and, uh, and Dr. Helen Edmonds and, and so many others, I can just, just remember the names. They just opened up our world and, and, and told us and taught us that we could, we could soar like an eagle, and, and I have. Mm -hmm. I had also had a liberal arts background, and it's funny too, when I went to undergrad at Federal State, I was interested in law. Um, I didn't pursue that, and the funny thing about it was uh, people would ask me, well, you're going to be a lawyer, or what type of law are you going to practice? And I said, well, I don't know if I'm going to actually practice law. I'm really interested in entertainment law. And then after I got down to the LSAT and some other things, I started to think, I said, maybe I just want to be in entertainment and media. Mm -hmm. So I just went that route. You, um, undergrad at NCCU, you know, you went to law school and then eventually you transitioned to politics. Um, how did you know that you wanted to go into law? How did you, this is something you always knew or, you know, how did that come about? It's something that I always knew and, 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 it, and it comes from my father. Okay. Uh, when my father uh, finished uh, dental school at Meharry in 1927, uh, he married my mother in 1928 and, and moved to my hometown of Wilson. And when he arrived in town, African Americans were not registered to vote. And the white power structure called him in and welcomed him to the community and let him know that uh, he was welcome to come to Wilson. And that since he was a, a, a black professional and, uh, and, and had fought in World War I, they were going to do him a favor. They were going to arrange for him to become a registered voter. Uh, as, as strange as that sounds, uh, that, that, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And so they, they hooked him up and, and let him become a registered voter. And he told me that he was the 40th African American in my home uh, to become a registered voter. Out of thousands of black people uh, who lived in the community, only 40 were registered to vote. And after he became a registered voter, he then tried to turn around and get other African Americans registered to vote. And that's when the white power structure called him in and and had a prayer meeting with him and, and explained to him that, that allowing him to register to vote was simply an accommodation, or a favor, if you will, uh, that it was not intended to be a massive effort to get all black people registered to vote. And, and he resented that. Uh, he resented it to the highest. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, we, we went through a depression uh, after that in the 1930s, and, and of course nothing happened politically. But in the 1940s, he started the local NAACP branch and he founded that branch for the express purpose of getting African Americans registered to vote. And so for several years, that was their thrust. They, we had a literacy test back then. You had to be able to read and write uh, in order to register to vote. Uh, but not only read and write, you had to be able to satisfy the registrar that you were literate. A lot of people miss that point. Uh, you, you had to read and write to the satisfaction of the registrar. And that becomes very subjective when a registrar has got to sign off uh, or evaluate your, your literacy. And, and, and white registrars at the time were not willing uh, to let African Americans uh, become voters. And so my father and the NAACP and others uh, created this massive effort to, uh, to get black people registered. They would teach the literacy test. And every Saturday morning in my home, they would get people in and, and explain to them how you can go about getting registered to vote and just maybe you could impress the registrar and, and, and get registered. Well, they did that for several years, and finally in 1953, uh, my dad looked at the voter registration statistics for the ward that we lived in and realized that black voter registration had pretty much equal white voter registration. And so he decided to run for the city council. And he did in 1953, and it was a tie vote. 
And in order to break the tie, they took both names and put them in a hat. And a little white girl reached into the hat and pulled out the name, and it was my father's name. Okay. And so in 1953, he became a registered voter, which was, which was a Barack Obama moment, mm -hmm. you know, at the time. Okay. Uh, yeah. He served on the city council and and was reelected in 1955, and was it, this was really a shock to the local power, uh, to local establishment. And so in 1957, uh, there was a change of procedure. Uh, the city council voted to, to change the method of election from district elections, whereby he would only run in a district, to at-large elections, whereby he would have to run citywide. And, and it, you know, everyone recognized that running citywide, he would not be able to win. So they changed the election procedure while he was out of town. Now, we were out of town on a family vacation when the city council called a, an emergency meeting and changed the rules. Uh, to, to, to transform the system to at-large voting. And so in 1957, he lost re-election. And in 1959, my pastor ran for that same seat, and he lost the election. And, and because of that experience, the black community got together, retained the NAACP, and a lawsuit was filed challenging the at-large method of election. Uh, that case went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and so any of our listeners who, who are curious about this, uh, they can look up uh, Watkins versus City of Wilson. It was a 1959, uh, 1960 case from the U.S. Supreme Court. They didn't win. They didn't win, um, but they challenged the system. And so I say all of that to say that I was a, I was a 10 or 11 or 12-year-old adolescent, mm -hmm. and I'm watching all of this unfold, and it made an impression on me. And so from that day forward, I wanted to be a lawyer. Okay. I wanted to be involved in politics. I wanted to be involved in community empowerment. And that has been my life story from, from that day to this day. Okay, okay. That sounds a very enriching story, and I'm glad you shared that because some of our younger viewers who may be becoming 17, 18, going off to college, they can at least understand the, the importance and significance of voting, especially my African Americans, um, for what you and uh, others had to go through to basically just get equal rights and civil rights. The literacy test was a weapon. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was a device that was used to keep African Americans from voting. And, and you, must, you must remember, and our, our viewers must remember that we had the literacy test all the way to 1965, which was the year I came to, to North Carolina Central University. The literacy test was finally eliminated when the Voting Rights Act was passed on August 6th of 1965. Uh, as, as part of the Voting Rights Act, there was a provision that made a literacy test unlawful as a prerequisite to registering to vote. And once the literacy test was removed, then good things began to happen. But they didn't happen overnight. I heard President Obama speaking uh, uh, a few days ago, and, and he made the same point. You, you don't make progress you know, overnight. It, mm -hmm. You, you it don't leapfrog in, into success. You know, it, it took a while. And so when the literacy test was taken off of, off of the books, uh, that's when I came to Durham. Uh, African Americans in Durham were, were a little bit more progressive than they were in rural communities in eastern North Carolina. So there was significant political activity in Durham. Mm -hmm. And after the literacy test was removed, it, 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 it really improved. But a lot of African Americans did not really believe that the literacy test had been had been eliminated. Mm -hmm. And so it was still a, a very difficult undertaking uh, to get African Americans to register to vote. Uh, they just didn't believe it, and those who did believe it were still fearful uh, to become registered voters. And so we worked hard. And finally, in 1968, we came up with a very novel idea uh, in order to stimulate uh, voter engagement. And that was an African American ran for governor of North Carolina in May of 1968, his name was Dr. Reginald Hawkins, and Eva Clayton ran for Congress uh, in what was then the second congressional district. Uh, we knew that those two individuals would not win that election, but they put their names on the ballot and they campaigned vigorously to, to, to send a message to African Americans that it's okay, that it's okay to get out and, and register to vote. They lost that election, uh, but because of that election, we won a lot of local races. And in Durham, Fred McNeil uh, was elected to the school board, which was a spinoff 
to the Hawkins Clayton effort in North Carolina. Okay, okay. Well, and, and um, so now basically now you were in the first you in the served in the first district. Um, we had recently had some changes. Uh, you're going to come into the fourth district, which is uh, Durham County, is part of that as well. well. Let me see if let me see if I can I can I can explain that and and and, and elaborate on on what you're saying. Every ten years. Mm -hmm. After the census is taken, the, the, the Constitution requires uh, that congressional districts be reconfigured. And the reason for that is that every congressman must represent the same number of people. It would be unfair for one congressman to represent a million people and another one to represent 500,000 people. Mm -hmm. That means that the 500,000 district would, would theoretically have more power than one representing a million. So every 10 years, Congressional districts have got to be redrawn, legislative districts, local districts, uh, that's required. And so when it's time to, to redraw the districts, you, you, you get the percentage that a state is to the national population. Uh, you find out what percentage North Carolina is as compared to the national population. And, and based on that, you get a percentage of the representatives. As we all know, there are only 435 members of the House. That doesn't increase or decrease. That stays the same. But once you do the math, you calculate what percentage your state is to, to all of the states, and that's the number of seats that you get in the House of Representatives. Okay. Uh, North Carolina, uh, 10 years ago, had 12 representatives. Uh, because of the 2000 census, it went up to 13 uh, because we had grown significantly. And so we were, we, we, we were awarded an extra seat, which meant that another state, state lost a seat. And so now we're 10 years later and it's time to do it again. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't quite grow enough in North Carolina to get an additional seat. And so we're gonna stay at 13. But the state has grown by one and a half million people. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of that growth has been right here in the Research Triangle area and a lot of it down in Charlotte. And so the districts have been redrawn. And because of the redistricting, I am now going to represent Durham, North Carolina. Uh, that, is, that is a high honor for me uh, because this is where I really cut my teeth uh, and, and, and got an education and cut my teeth in political engagement. It's like a second homecoming, at least in terms of your career. It, it is a second homecoming. The only sad part about it is that uh, if, if this plan holds, and it's going to be tested in court, and it's being tested in court. But if this plan holds, then I'm going to displace a very dear friend, Congressman David Price, uh, who is now being moved to another district. Uh, I will not be the fourth district. I will continue to be the first district. Uh, but David Price's district, if this thing holds, uh, will start way up in Alamance County and meander its way all the way down to Fayetteville. Uh, it's going to be a real unwieldy district. Uh, David Price is a is a progressive Democrat who has done great things as a member of Congress. He, he's a dean of our delegation. He's on the Appropriations Committee in the House of Representatives. And the only uh, sad part about this realignment is that I'm going to be displacing David Price in Durham. Uh, but David Pl Price is, a, is, is going to continue to be a good friend. We talk almost every day, and uh, we're on the same page with this. Last year, correct me if I'm wrong, 2010, uh, the winter and fall commencement uh, for NCCU, you were the guest speaker and you addressed the uh, graduates. And there's two philosophies that really stood out to me and I'd like for you to share to our audience and viewers, basically, you know, the principles. One is, being, you said, be faithful to your family. Um, go into that a little bit. What's being faithful to your family? One of the greatest honors of my life was to give that commencement speech at North Carolina Central University. It did something really, really special for me. Uh, to be able to go back to your alma mater and, and be the commencement speaker is, is a high honor. During that speech, I talked about three things. I talked about being faithful to your family, to the university, and to yourself. And I elaborated on each one of those. Uh, but your family is, should be the most important thing in your life. And I think most of our viewers are probably nodding their heads right now because that is, that is so important. And the older I get, the more I value and treasure the, 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 the family unit. Uh, because when it's all said and done, uh, when, you, when you start reaching those senior years and those twilight years, uh, the people who are gonna be there for you will be your family. And so we, we must keep that in perspective. Uh, you must remember that, that your ancestors didn't have the privileges and the opportunities that we have today. And so each generation should get better. 
and and we must we must understand the, the importance of family. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, we must understand the importance of historically black colleges, uh, the, the contribution of North Carolina Central University, not just to Durham, but the contribution to black education in this state and country is unparalleled. Uh, Dr. Shepard started uh, our university in 1910, and he worked all the way to 1947, I think it was, you know, training a generation of, of young black educators who walked across that stage at, at North Carolina College and went into the hitherlands and back into rural North Carolina and trained my generation uh, and, and, and provided us an education. And so we must understand the, 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 the role that historically black colleges, including North Carolina Central, have played to the empowerment of our community. But at the end of the day, what matters, I suppose, the most is you've got to have principles, you've got to have values, and you've got to be true to yourself. And that's one thing yeah. that spoke to me. You say also be faithful to yourself. And absolutely, you've got to be. You got to be the same whether you're in private or in public. Uh, your values have got to be constant. And and I said that during the speech. I I say it so very often. And and I just want our younger generation uh, to to recognize those those three things. Uh, I'm so proud of our younger generation. I'm proud of you and the staff of people who work uh, with you uh, in producing this program because it gives me. Be, me hope and, and faith that, that we're okay in our community and we're going to continue to empower our community. We're going to continue to stay involved. We've got a big election coming up in 2012. And, and yes, I will be on the ballot in Durham, but it's not only about me, but it's about empowering our community. The same goal that we had in 1965 is the same goal that we have in 2012. And that is the African American community needs to have a fair opportunity to achieve the American dream. Uh, we need to close the disparities between black, white, and brown in this country. We need to bring all of the statistics together. Uh, poverty, one out of six uh, people in this country living in poverty, completely unacceptable. And so we must do a better job, and so we must be engaged in the next election. Uh, the people of Durham County are going to hear a lot from me over the next uh, few months. And I'm going to bring my message to Durham, but it's going to include uh, a young generation, uh, your generation. Uh, you're going to be fully involved in, in not only in my campaign, but in my work as a member of Congress. I'm going to open a congressional office in Durham, and we're going to have Durham staff, and we're going to continue the work uh, that David Price started many years ago. Okay, okay. And before we wrap up and go, um, just two other things. Uh, what would you say to the young person viewing it? this uh, program who knows that they want to be in law or in politics, um, you know, when they get older or when they, after they leave college, you know, what can they do now? And um, if anybody wants to um, be a part of your campaign sure. or contribute, what can they do? We are a government of laws and values. And, and, and the two people, the two, the two offices that keep our government strong would be those who make public policy, which would be the politicians and the lawyer. Uh, the one who keeps government honest and, 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 and represents uh, people who have been, been locked out of a process. And those two uh, jobs are very honorable positions. I would encourage our, our young people to look at law and politics you know, as an avenue of, of success. Uh, it was for me and it can, can be for, for other people. Uh, my website is gkbutterfield.com. Uh, it's it's a very native web, website now, but it's going to evolve into uh, a better website as we go along. Uh, but it's gkbutterfield.com. It's it's a it's an opportunity to reach out to me and to uh, and to um, be a part of my campaign. I want I want a significant involvement of young people in Durham in my campaign because I want to to try to grow a new generation of leaders. I'm 64 years old. I recognize that and don't run from it uh, one bit. Uh, but and and when I when my generation moves off the scene, uh, we need another generation ready to step into our shoes. Uh, Dr. Lavonia Allison at the Durham Committee talks about it all the time. Uh, she has been a great warrior in Durham over the years as Mayor Bell and, and you know Howard Clement and all of the other friends. I shouldn't have called names, but That's okay. but, but but I did. I can I can call the role in Durham. Yeah. Uh, because I have relationships of uh, Senator Floyd McKissick and is another example. Uh, you know, people, Coral Cole McFadden. Uh, the, yeah, the, the, this is my yeah. generation, yeah. and we have worked hard to to set the stage uh, for another generation to come in behind us. Yeah, I interviewed Bill Bell, uh, Mayor Bell, a 
few months ago as well. So yeah, I had the Absolutely. privilege of speaking with him. Well, Con Honorable Congressman Butterfield, I do appreciate you spending time with me today. It was very enriching for me. I learned a lot. I'm sure our viewers who didn't know um, as much about North Carolina history and politics have learned a lot as well. Um, anytime we can do another show with you, I would love to have you on. Anything I can do to help you in the future, um, you know, you I will be willing and ready to go. I look forward to coming back to your program and doing another segment. Uh, I am a historian, uh, not by training, but uh, by habit. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a lot of history that I'd like to share with the people of Durham because Durham has been a, a very integral part of the empowerment of black people in, in North Carolina. It's, it's a story that needs to be told. All right. Well, thank you again, Congressman. Thank I you. appreciate your time. Thank you. And thank you all for viewing. I'll see you next time.